Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome from the Vivo Spine headquarters for the today's webcast about full endoscopic uh, techniques. Today's topic is um, full endoscopic applications at the thoracic and cervical spine. We are very happy to perform this webcast today with Dr. Rutten and Dr. Com from St. Anna Hospital in Herne. They are very experienced with these, these very special topics in full endoscopic techniques since a long time and we are very happy that they share their experience with us. We are now connected to the St. Anna Hospital in Hörne and to my colleague Jochen Breuer-Steinbach. Welcome Dr. Rütten and Dr. Kom to today's webcast and thank you very much for your time. Today's topic are full endoscopic techniques at the cervical and thoracic spine. Let's start with some questions to Dr. Rütten and Dr. Kom. Dr. Rütten, what are the advantages of full endoscopic surgery at the cervical spine? Okay, are the main indications for the cervical procedure uh, radiculopathy uh, in, in the case of disc herniation or foramenal stenosis. And here normally the ACDF is a standard procedure. But uh, it has always been uh, tried to maintain mobility. And the most common procedure for that was the posterior or is the posterior keyhole foramenotomy. And with a full, uh, full endoscopic procedure, especially the posterior approach, um, the, these well-known advantages from the lumbar spine could be adapted and the disadvantages of the conventional procedure reduced. Dr. Komp, you told me once your first choice when it comes to surgery is always to do it full endoscopically. There are more and more indications you try to operate with this full endoscopic technique. Yes, of course, uh, indications uh, are growing with your experience. Um, that was uh, the same in our case. Uh, so, um, as Dr. Rutten already um, stated, the classic indication um, for um, the cervical operation is a um, classical disc herniation. But of course, when you get more experience, you can widen your um, spectrum and uh, you can um, resect bones, so you can uh, treat bony stenosis, uh, especially in the foraminal area, foraminal stenosis. But um, also epidural um, processes like cysts um, or uh, bleedings or abscesses are uh, done with this posterior approach. And you do this also regularly? So yes. Okay. Dr. Rütten, uh, your scientific work has contributed significantly to the establishment of endoscopic techniques, meanwhile worldwide uh, known. Uh, do you work currently on studies? Yeah, as you rightly said, uh, we have conducted many studies. Mm, and of course, we're still examining patients today and uh, we will also validate them scientifically where, when new surgical steps, for example, um, are introduced. However, um, we or I myself wish that this scientific work would be taken over to other interested persons. And uh, nowadays, when we look in the literature, we're really seeing a lot of well-done um, scientific studies in the field of full endoscopic spine surgery. And uh, that means we can withdraw a little bit and uh, leave the field to a more. Yeah. Is the numbers of studies increasing when it comes to regarding to full endoscopic uh, surgery? You mean techniques? in general in the yes. literature? Uh, yeah, extremely. Yeah. Really? We, we really find about every area of the spine a lot of well-done studies. Dr. Komp, what developments do you see for the future for full endoscopic spine surgery? There are some major things you think, okay, these are the next things who will come up? I don't know. I've never been good uh, looking in the future, but uh, I can say that there will be certainly development on the technical side, the mean side of the endoscope and instruments. Um, uh, robotic and navigation is a uh, current topic um, and we are closely monitoring that um, but we don't see a breakthrough uh, like uh, right now. Um, but for now I think the focus will be probably um, on decompression. Uh, but what we are seeing um, however is the increasing global um, establishment for these full endoscopic techniques not only 
on the um, side of the studies, what we also mentioned. Um, but um, additionally, more and more surgeons uh, are performing these operations, and the young uh, surgeons are growing up with this technique, um, and uh, this technique is a part of their daily work. Dr. Ritten, when it comes to education, the learning curve is a you know, big issue, and a lot of surgeons are talking about learning curves. and. Do you have some tips for surgeons who want to start with full endoscopic techniques from your side, uh, how to yeah, increase the learning curve? Uh, so basically, of course, there is a learning curve, definitely. And especially due to the learning curve, we all know that, the risk of complications uh, is increased or can be increased. And this is always a problem when you switch uh, from, from one technique to, to another technique. Yeah? Um, but there are also many published study, studies on this field today. And uh, if we look at these and the experiences from laparoscopy, we can say that the full endoscopic uh, techniques have a learning curve, definitely, I said already, but it's not an extraordinary one. It's a normal learning curve when you switch to another uh, technique. In any case, we recommended starting uh, carefully and well prepared. And that includes, for example, observations of hospitals or observations of operations, training courses, or during the first operations, support from the company, or something, something like that. So thank you very much for this interview. We will now continue with the presentations. And after that, we will see some live surgery performed by Dr. Ritten and Dr. Komp. Thank you very much and welcome back. Yes, we organized a very interesting program for you today. We have two lectures, one about the cervical application uh, performed by Dr. Kong, one about the thoracic applications performed by Dr. Rütten, and we prepared a live surgery that we recorded in the morning today for you. After these three parts, we will have a live discussion with Dr. Rütten and Dr. Com. So whenever you have questions, please, please use these um, chat functions in YouTube or send us a message to education at vivospine.com. Let's start now with the first lecture performed by Dr. Com about the cervical full endoscopic application. For the last uh, 60 minutes, just a little bit uh, overview about cervical and thoracic spine, and I will start with the um, cervical spine. Can you mal Licht ausmachen? And again, we are talking about uh, decompression techniques, and that means uh, mainly we are talking about radicular symptoms caused by herniation or stenosis. Um, when we want to create an approach to the cervical spine, you know, we have different options either from the anterior or from the posterior um, aspect. And uh, until now, the ACDF is a standard procedure for a cervical disc herniation, for example, um, though we know it's a quite large procedure for a small pathology. And we also know the problems of ACDF, um, implant-related problems and uh, approach-related problems. And also in the cervical spine, there's a tendency to more minimal invasive techniques uh, in the last decades. And they are alternatives to, um, uh, uh, for the um, approaches for disc herniation from the anterior aspect, oncophoraminotomy or ACD without fusion, and from the posterior aspect, the uh, uh, chiophoraminotomy. Problems with that approach uh, is also well known, especially epidural bleeding and uh, neck pain after surgery. So we have two approaches uh, to the cervical spine with an endoscope, um, the posterior and anterior approach. And uh, generally, when we are working at the cervical spine, we like to have our patients fixed uh, with his head. So we are always uh, working with the Mayfield clam. Um, there are other people who are working with, uh, just with tapes to fix the head. Um, we also like to um, have the, um, uh, the arms fixed with uh, some uh, special uh, drapes here to pull the shoulder down, to, um, especially when you're working at the lower cervical levels. So let's have a closer look first to the anterior approach. Um, um, the first um, Precondition for this approach is that you have to palpate or have to have the possibility to palpate the anterior part of the vertebral body. 
especially in um, muscular uh, main, in um, lower cervical levels, this is sometimes even not possible. Um, we perform this approach as a contralateral approach. Um, that means it's a transdiscal approach from the opposite side to the uh, target that we have here in the posterior aspect of the um, disc. Um, first, we mark the stern sternocleid muscle, then we palpate the anterior parts of the uh, vertebral body. Uh, we mark the level that we want to operate, and then we do a um, small skin incision, uh, palpate again the anterior parts of the vertebral body, and uh, insert the um, small dilator, and when we insert the dilator, we have to make sure that we insert it uh, at the apex of the intervertebral space, um, that we are um, entering the contralateral side. We have to avoid to uh, be too far to the lateral side, because we have the neurostructure and uh, the uh, vertebral artery. Then we put in a special dilation system um, through the smallest um, dilator or the over the smallest dilator until the dilation system is completely in the disc, um, and um, that's the final uh, operation cannula. And through this operation cannula, we put in the endoscope, and beside the endoscope, we are working with our instruments. Um, example for that, C6, C7 on the right side. Um, that means um, um, that um, we are always working here in the posterior part of the intervertebral space uh, due to the concavity of uh, the uh, vertebral bodies. You know that from open surgery, um, in most of the cases, uh, it is necessary to get access uh, to um, the spinal canal to resect bone here. Um, then we have to, uh, th that is lateral here, here is medial. Um, um, cr um, cranial and caudal. Then we have the uh, posterior ligament, uh, which is in front of us. And um, that's the defect here in the posterior ligament where the herniation went through. So resection then of the herniated material. And um, we have the possibility to uh, palpate with a flexible probe a little bit behind the vertebral bodies. Um, and you see already the um, pedura here of the cervical myelon. So palpation here, fishing for some remnant pieces. Other example to show uh, just uh, the possibilities uh, for mobility um, operation on the left side. So first preparation, um, and uh, then again um, the preparation of the bony structures, unkinate process, and the decompression. So um, preparation here, and uh, then starting uh, with bone resection. Um, again, due to the um, concavity of the vertebral bodies, you have to resect a bone to get access uh, to that, but you have the possibility, especially when you want to work in the uh, foramen area, um, to resect um, the um, parts of the unkinate process to get uh, access um, in this area. See the unkinate process here, uh, see the ligament, and then we have the possibility to resect um, more bone there. Um, either you can do this with automatic drills or with uh, manual drills. So resection here. And then the preparation to the, um, to the lateral aspect this manual drill, like you saw this already uh, in the lumbar spine. Of course, the instruments are much smaller. And now, step by step, you can get access to the lateral part, that means to the foramen, and uh, follow the neurostructures, follow the dura and the neurostructure of the um, cervical nerve. So after preparation here of the last tissue of the posterior ligament, we see the dura here of the cervical um, myelon, and then the beginning of the cervical nerve here. So just to show you um, what is possible with this approach, step by step, 
we see now the beginning of the of the cervical nerve here. That's the dura of the cervical myeloma. Transdiscal approach and blunt dissection of the structures after removal of the whole system. But when we're talking about this anterior approach, we are immediately in the discussion uh, what happens with the disc. Um, is ACD um, enough? Of course, when we compare the dimension of the operation tube with a standard cage, um, this is not that much. But of course, we are destroying parts of the disc. And uh, <coughs> the discussion is always there what happens with the disc, um, what happens with instability, what's happened uh, with kyphosis. In the literature, it's uh, quite um, good described that we have narrowing of the disc base, but without any clinical symptoms. Um, Indications are radicular symptoms caused by soft disc herniation located on disc level, but we have problems, the palpation of the anterior parts of the vertebral bodies. Um, when you're not sure that you can uh, separate um, vessels and uh, the esophagus uh, by palpating, uh, you have a higher risk to damage uh, something, restricted mobility when you are in the, um, in the vertebral space, and it is a transdiscal procedure um, without fusion. The other approach is the posterior approach to the cervical spine, very ne near to that what we know from the lumbar spine. Um, again, we are working with a 25 degree optical system. Um, we are passing the flavum ligament, um, and um, we are starting in AP, marking the midline and the middle of the lateral mass. So we have these two, two lines. Then we have to identify the level that we want to operate, place a needle uh, to the middle of the uh, lateral mass uh, in direction to the disc space that we want to operate. That is very important to stay parallel to the disc level. Um, we have um, not much space in this area. Um, and due to ergonomic uh, situation, it is really necessary to stay uh, parallel uh, or um, just in line of the uh, vertebral, uh, intervertebral space and not uh, in this or this direction. So we do the skin incision after marking with a needle, insert the dilator, um, then you feel the bone here of the lateral mass. Um, over the uh, dilator goes um, the um, operation cannula. It is uh, mandatory to um, have this bony contact. Uh, avoid to um, be too far in the middle. Avoid to be too far lateral. That's the reason why you should mark your um, a landmark before you start with your skin incision. Operation cannula is inserted, opening to the medial aspect, and the endoscope is inserted. Then it's a very standardized procedure. Um, first, we prepare all the structures. Um, uh, this is the left side. That means the left side is cranial, right side is caudal. That's the flavum ligament here. So when we identified all the structures, we start with bone resection. And bone resection is always starting uh, at the medial portion of the um, descending facade and um, resecting then, also always starting at the uh, descending uh, part because the flavum ligament grows much further below the uh, lamina. Um, and again, you can thin here the bone, like you saw that um, during the operation. And later, you can uh, take it out with a punch. And then we uh, change to the caudal aspect um, and um, resect um, bone there. Be careful here. The flavum ligament ends very far, uh, fast um, at the uh, caudal uh, parts, uh, caudal parts of the lamina. Uh, and it opens uh, very easily. Um, it is absolutely mandatory, you see here, it opens very easily to finish your bone work uh, and you have to control it uh, during the operation and the CM um, before you open the flavum ligament because later it is much more dangerous to resect uh, bone, especially when you start with these procedures. Opening of the flavum ligament medially, uh, like in the lumbar spine, and then we uh, resect uh, the flavum ligament and have to identify um, the next anatomical landmarks, that's the venous complex around the um, cervical myelon. And um, then we have to identify the lateral margin of the um, dura of the cervical myelon and the cervical nerve. So that's the lateral margin here. And then um, we have to um, decompress the thin bone um, until we find all the other 
structures, that means the uh, cervical nerve and uh, the herniation. See the cervical nerve here, see the herniation, lateral margin of the cervical myelom. And then um, resection of the herniation, here beginning of the cervical nerve, and uh, then the resection of the herniation. And for these uh, procedures, it's absolutely um, helpful to really stop every bleeding that you find. So you can go below the uh, cervical nerve. You can go a little bit with the um, branch um, um, below the uh, dura of the cervical myelon, but it's absolutely forbidden to mobilize the um, cervical myelon. Other example, C67 on the left side. Uh, that means, again, left side is cranial, right side is caudal. Um, descending facet, ascending facet, and uh, the flavum ligament here in this triangle. Again, starting with bone work at the descending facet. And cranial lamina. Step by step, you resect bone. And flavum ligament, again, stays intact as long as possible. Find this margin between the bony structure and the ligament. That is very important to uh, know where you can start with your uh, drill. And then we start to open the uh, epidural space. Again, venous complex around the myelon. Preparation to the lateral aspect, resection of the flavum ligament um, until we can identify um, clearly the structures. Again, lateral margin of the dura of the cervical myelon and um, the cervical nerve. Resection. And you always should be able to resect as much bone that you really can see both sides of the nerve. That means shoulder and axilla side. That's very important um, because uh, you, uh, the nerve is quite fixed. You are not able to mobilize it like in the lumbar spine. Um, but you should see both sides, that you have the possibility to mobilize on both sides. <coughs> Another example on the right side, that means right side is cranial, left side is caudal. Again, flavum ligament, descending facet, ascending facet. That's the joint, descending facet. Sometimes you have a uh, quite large interlaminar window, and you don't have to resect too much. Sometimes uh, you have uh, the laminae uh, directly uh, opposite of each other, and you have to resect a lot of bone. Then again, opening of the flavum ligament, um, cervical nerve, medial portion or medial margin of the uh, dura of the cervical myelon, herniation uh, here in this case directly in the axilla. And um, in most of the cases, it is not possible to enter directly the disc space because in most of the cases, the cervical nerve uh, is directly lying over the um, disc space. In this case, uh, it was possible to enter the, um, the disc space. But you see, again, we are um, checking both sides of the cervical nerve. This is very important. For amyl stenosis, uh, or um, we have, uh, for example, other indications for uh, posterior uh, decompression, um, osteophytes, um, situation after ventral decompression and fusion, or anterior decompression and fusion. Um, so the sur surgical steps are the same. Um, but of course, you uh, have to make yourself clear that you are not working with soft um, material, but uh, you have the possibility to mobilize the structures. That means you have to mobilize the cervical nerve. Um, so it is helpful to create really um, more space. Um, so your bone work, you see the uh, thin and bone here, which later can be resected with a punch. So after opening the flavum ligament, we start to resect um, the flavum ligament and then the um, thin bone. Again, first intraspinal. Um, landmark is the lateral margin of the 
um, dura of the cervical myelin, resection of the um, thin bone here, and then step by step, um, as more uh, space you have, you can use uh, uh, drills to enlarge uh, the foramen. Here is the um, osteophyte, uh, which is here compressing the um, C6 nerve root directly from the anterior aspect. And then you have, again, different options. Either you use the manual drills. Uh, you can quite well work with a um, micro punch. In this case, when we have uh, um, made enough space, you can use the cannula a little bit to mobilize the nerve, but not the cervical myelin. That's the nerve, cervical nerve here, which leaves the foramen. And that's the situation after decompression. Another uh, example, um, C4, C5, foramenal stenosis. Uh, so decompression here for um, this uh, quite uh, lateral um, pathology. Just to show you what is possible. So a pure decompression and then um, a posterior decompression of the foramen and then um, anterior decompression of uh, those osteophytes. Um, but be careful when you're working um, in the foramen. Um, the dimension of the foramen is not as big as you may think. Yeah, that means we have here the, uh, the osteophyte, which is then uh, removed afterwards. And um, later on, we see um, the cervical nerve. Um, we can mobilize again the cervical nerve with our cannula. Um, but what we see here is uh, below the cervical nerve, that's the vertebral artery. That means we are working directly um, in the neighborhood when you're resecting a lot of bone here to the lateral aspect. Um, we are um, coming uh, to the anterior aspect, and then we have the vertebral artery direct uh, in front of us. So be careful. Um, stay here um, at the, um, uh, or remember always where the posterior line of the vertebral bodies is to avoid to uh, get too far to the uh, ventral aspect because there we find the vertebral artery. Other things you know that uh, from the literature, we find a lot of uh, variations. Uh, here, for example, a uh, bipartite spinal uh, cervical nerve uh, with one motoric and one sensoric uh, fascicle. Um, sometimes you see really a lot of uh, different things. Always be aware of that when you preparate the cervical spine. Um, so with a posterior approach, we have no limitations in direction to craniocaudal uh, due to the possibility to uh, do bone resection. We have limitations um, to get to the medial aspect, but when we consider that 95% of the herniations that are causing radicular pain are lying in this mediolateral or foramenal area, um, we uh, can say um, we have, uh, with a posterior approach, um, the possibility to uh, get most of these herniations out. So the indications are radicular symptoms caused by soft disc herniations or stenosis, localized medial lateral, lateral, um, all kind of anterior pathology, or each localization of posterior pathology. And for us, this is clearly our preferred approach to the cervical spine. Another thing is always, uh, as we told you, at the lumbar spine, when we start with these operations, you um, should always look for the indication. Um, we are talking about ridiculous symptoms. We are not talking about situations like that, like a colibri. Um, um, this uh, problem uh, wouldn't cause ridiculous problems, but central nerve systems uh, problems. Um, and the question is always, which Technique should I uh, use if I have a pathology like that, anterior, posterior, conventional, full endoscopic? Just be aware that sometimes, for example, a, a CT scan may help you. Because uh, when you start with this problem, the first thing is, um, for an anterior approach, um, look at the osteophytes here. Uh, you have um, no uh, possibilities to enter that. And again, the posterior pathology is absolutely calcified. So you will get in uh, big trouble. So that wouldn't be an indication for an endoscopic procedure. Looking at the um, evidence-based medicine, again, a lot of uh, um, literature about these both techniques. 
nowadays. Um, again, we um, discussed um, our own um, literature and the scientific work in a lot of evidence-based medicine sessions. And we con uh, could conclude that we uh, achieved the results of the standard procedure with all advantages of the minimal invasive technique, like we have shown that also in the lumbar spine. Um, there um, is a one paper um, comparing the anterior and posterior approach that states that there's no difference uh, between both approaches. Especially in the Asian countries, the anterior approach is uh, very uh, famous now. But um, beside the pure decompression for disc herniation or spinal stenosis, there are um, more and more, as you get more experience, we have more and more uh, indication that um, can be covered by the full endoscopic field. For example, this uh, Z-joint cyst, um, C7TH1, causing a uh, myelopathy uh, lying here uh, in the daughter part. And you see a quite large uh, cyst here. So most of the cysts are located in the lumbar spine, but sometimes we have it in the uh, cervical spine too. Um, and um, the first uh, thing, posterior approach, is here a um, hemilaminectomy of uh, C7. Um, you see the, um, that's the medial part of the um, C7 lamina. The rest is uh, resected. Um, that's the dura here of the cervical myelom. Uh, that's the cyst. So the cyst is completely resected. Um, and um, then step by step, we preparate the um, cervical nerve or cervical nerves, um, resection of the last tissue of the cyst. Um, so dura of the cervical myelom, that's the C8 nerve here. That's, here was the cyst on the um, cervical myelom. Rotation to the cranial aspect, that's the C7 nerve. And here starts the C6 nerve. So we have more and more possibilities with this approach, especially from the um, Posterior aspect, but we have, uh, there's a special indication um, which you also published um, for an anterior decompression um, of the uh, odontoid process um, in, um, yeah, in um, compression of the cervical medullary junction. And you can use a um, retropharyngeal approach um, and um, with your endoscope, this is C1 arc. Um, and um, that's the um, basis of the uh, dense axis. That's the dense axis here, or the os odontideum. And um, then we have to start to resect um, at the basis here. You see the pre and post oblique pictures. Um, rheum um, rheumatic patient with acute myelopathy and uh, tetraplegia, so we had to fix them from the dorsal aspect and to release it from the anterior aspect. Um, and then we have the um, tip here of the um, dense axis, which is resected. That is, everything is approach, because the problem is the soft tissue behind the dense axis. So um, we have to resect the panis tissue to decompress um, the dura of the um, cervical um, cranial cervical junction, and we already see here the dura. And um, after decompression, that's the C1, C2 joint on the left side. Um, the C1, uh, C1 arc is uh, can always be uh, uh, can be staying in place, so you don't have to resect the C1 arc, and you see the decompressed um, cervical, um, the <laughs> cranial medullary junction. Okay, thank you. That's uh, an overview about the cervical spine, and uh, we are just uh, going straight to the, yeah, okay? Okay, sorry, thanks. So then we just can discuss the cervical spine um, before we start with the thoracic spine. Um, questions for the cervical spine? Quite, of course, I, I always emphasize that. When, when, you, when we are presenting and you, you saw the case presentations and uh, during the workshops, uh, there are some people who are uh, working on the cervical spine. Just one advice, don't um, leave 
the normal steps. The normal steps are first lumbar spine, getting access to disc herniations, then preparing in patients uh, um, bone structures, drilling, maybe where drilling is not so necessary, but where you can practice it. Then start with higher lumbar levels where you have to drill. And step by step, you can go uh, to other indications. That is important because when you start at the cervical spine, you will have a catastrophe, not only for you, but for the patient too. And you have to use the drill in 100% in the um, cervical spine and in the thoracic spine. So you have to be able to manage uh, all these things. That is very important, I think. Thank you very much, Dr. Kompf, for this great presentation. All the other questions we will answer after our sessions in our discussion round with Dr. Kom and Dr. Rutten live that also our online uh, participants can uh, have the possibility to ask questions and to get answers. So whenever you have questions, please send us your information in this uh, YouTube chat function or please send us a message to education at rebospine.com. Okay, now let's continue with the next topic today. We will uh, um, switch over to Herne again to a live surgery, a cervical endoscopic case that we uh, recorded in the morning today. And this surgery is performed by Dr. Kohn. So this is a 29-year-old patient suffering from arm pain since several months now. And we see the preoperative imaging. The pictures on the bottom are um, six months ago. We see a fresh herniation. Um, the patient was treated, uh, but he's not getting along with the pain. In the middle, we see the actual MRI. It is not a fresh herniation anymore, but uh, the patient still has his radicular problems. So we decided to do an endoscopic dorsal decompression. Uh, we will not find, uh, I think, a fresh uh, piece. Uh, we will see adhesions, uh, but at least um, this is a good case to show the principles of an endoscopic dorsal um, procedure. So the first thing what we start with, we have the patient in uh, Mayfield clam uh, in prone position, and we start in AP just to uh, mark first the midline um, of the cervical spine. So first, we, the first line is in just the mid midline, line of the spinous process. And then the second line is a line uh, in the middle of the lateral mass. So we just draw those two lines. And then we change uh, the CM into the lateral position. Ja, einmal horizontal stellen bitte und den C-Bogen deckenwärts fahren. Ja, danke, danke, danke. Jetzt mal ein bisschen kopfwärts fahren. Bisschen tiefer wieder. Ja. Zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sechs, sieben. Genau da ist er dann. Ganz toll. Genau, mal an dem Dings da spielen. Kontrast. Ja, fahren wir ein bisschen kopfwärts. Okay, so. So, mal festmachen. So, the problem always in main is, of course, the shoulders. We uh, have some weights at the arms to uh, pull the shoulders down. Um, now we mark the level that we want to operate. In this case, uh, C6, C7 on the right side. So, we have to check just uh, on the level, so I don't listen here again.
and the needle has to be just in direction to the um, to the disk that we want to operate. Yeah. So now we check it again. I'm a bit in Kopfwärts fahren wieder. Okay, wieder festmachen. So we mark just the uh, our entry point for the skin incision, and then we remove the needle and do the skin incision in the line of the middle of the lateral mass. Okay. Then we insert the dilator. Feel already bone here. Okay, I'm going to use it. And then we insert the baffled operation cannula opening to the medial aspect. It's very similar to that what we do at the lumbar spine. So now the cannula is in front of the lateral mass, and then we insert the endoscope and start to work. So the first step now during the operation is to preparate the bony structures of the lateral mass and the facet, electrospitter. And just one advice, always stop every bleeding that you see because uh, it worsens the, um, just the visualization. Here I feel a bony structure in front of me. Röntgen bild bitte. So it, from the radiogram, it's a bone of the ascending facet. So we see that's the ascending facet, that's the descending uh, part, and here we see the joint. So we're operating right side, right side is cranial, left side is caudal. Here's the way to the medial aspect, here's the way to the lateral aspect. So next thing is we have to uh, follow the bone to the medial aspect and to prepare the interlaminar window. So here starts the flavum ligament. the joint here. Dann brauche ich einmal den kleinen Rangeur gleich. Yeah. Okay. So be careful, the flavum ligament at the cervical spine is very thin. So again, overview about the anatomy. Descending facet, ascending facet, that's the joint here. And in the middle, like a triangle, the flavum ligament. So now I have to start with bone work. Bone work means at the cervical spine, you should, uh, especially when you're not able to identify where the uh, nerve, um, cervical nerve is, and this is nearly impossible, you should resect bone uh, enough from cranial to caudal. Um, if you're not sure, uh, resect bone from uh, the cranial to the caudal pedicle. We always start with bone resection at the uh, cranial part because uh, the flavum uh, grows much uh, further below the cranial lamina. So always we start here with bone resection in the cranial part.
attached layer one ligament stays intact as long as possible. It's a kind of protection layer in front of your instruments. the tip here of the ascending facet. And now we start with uh, bone resection at the cord lamina. Here in this case, young men with uh, a lot of bone, so we have to take our time for that. And you can see the diamond. So that was the resection of the first layer of bone. Uh, now we do fine tuning with the diamond drill. Okay, so bone work uh, should be done. I'm going to find fine ranger number. So we thin the bone here at the ascending facet, caudal lamina, um, descending facet, and a descending facet and um, cranial lamina. The next step is now to open the spinal canal. Da brauche ich einmal die Schere für. We do that like we do that in the lumbar spine. That means we open the flavum ligament in the medial aspect. And then to the lateral aspect. einmal die Schere noch mal. Groß. Ja, den Rangeur. Fat tissue.
Gib mal den größeren Rauscher, bitte. Elektrisch. find the lateral margin of the dura of the cervical myelon. Haben wir nochmal ein Röntgenbild, bitte. Nochmal ein Röntgenbild. A little bit more to the cranial and caudal aspect. to resect more bone to the portal aspect. to resect uh, a little bit more to the core aspect that we really can see both parts of the nerve. Dann brauche ich uh, noch mal die Stanze. Und wenn das nicht geht, brauche ich auch gleich den Fräser eventuell noch mal. Although we, I expect the pathology here in the shoulder area, I resect, I resect a little bit more of bone to get access to the uh, axilla portion of the C7 nerve. portion of the C7 nerve here. Dann brauchen wir noch mal ein Röntgenbild, bitte. And you see how caudal the nerve is. Haben wir noch mal die uh, Röntgen. Yeah, that's the disc space here. That's the C7 nerve. And here in the cranial aspect uh, the C6 nerve starts. Okay, now we have to find the herniation from the anatomy. Right side is cranial. Here starts the C6 nerve. Here's the C7 nerve. Shoulder area, axilla area. Here's the foramen. And now we have to look for the herniated material, which we don't expect to be too fresh. Klein Rangeur, bitte.
Ich habe nochmal den kleinen Rangeur. Gut, dann brauche ich die kleine Schere bitte einmal. Bild mal bitte und für mich ein Rangeur. So this piece was lying. Have a Röntgen Bild. Here I get the junction to the disk space. Why not the kleine Schere? So now we have to prepare a little bit more to the medial aspect. So it is allowed to mobilize the neural structure. Um, Rangeur fine, yeah. but it's not allowed to mobilize the cervical myelon, of course. Elektrisch, bitte. Material here. Then, kleinen Rangeur, bitte. is here vertebral body. That's the defect here, that's the entry to the this space. There we can resect some more of the ligamentary structures. Dann bitte einmal den kleinen Rangeur. So it is possible to lift up the structures and to go and to look below the structures. We see already the free movement of the neural structure. That's always a good sign. But always you should, uh, before you finish the operation, you should check the other part of the um, of the neural structure. Oh, klein Ronge, bitte nochmal. This sector, bitte. Mm. 
So it is allowed to mobilize the cervical nerve, not allowed to mobilize the cervical myelin. Here was the renated material, and here is the entry to the disc space. Can we have a Röntgen bild? Yeah, in cranial disc space. Can we have a Röntgen bild? Uh, and here, caudal of the disc space. Okay, then brauche ich noch einmal. Um, Ein kleinen Rangeur. Und einmal elektrisch. So, just for the anatomy. C7, C7 nerve on the right side, um, shoulder portion, axilla portion. Here was the herniated material. Here we are going to the cranial aspect, beginning of the C6 nerve here. And that's the situation after decompression. Thank you very much, Dr. Com, for this excellent surgery. And uh, welcome back, dear ladies and gentlemen. We now continue with the thoracic lecture, um, very, um, yeah, compared to even lumbar and, and even cervical applications, uh, um, surgery that is performed not very often, as you know. But uh, also, therefore, Dr. Rutten, Dr. Com, they developed the concept how to do this. And Dr. Rutten will present this lecture now. After that, we will start with a discussion with Dr. Rutten and Dr. Com. And whenever you have questions, please use this chat function of YouTube or send us a message to education at rebusbahn.com. Well, now, thoracic spine, that's really rare. So I told you we perform so around 1,500 uh, endoscopic procedures a year, and I would say depends on the year, 5, 10, 15 at the thoracic spine. So it's really a rare situation. Uh, we're talking only about, we call it degenerative situations. These are th uh, thoracic disc herniations and spinal stenosis. And uh, here at the thoracic spine, we don't uh, treat only patients with radicular pain also patients with myelopathy, of course, yeah? So we have, uh, on one side, we have our thoracic disc herniations. You know, these herniations can be soft or calcified, uh, or very strong calcified, and a uh, special form is the giant uh, herniation occupying more than 40% of the spinal canal. And this uh, um, giant disc herniation is often calcified, and we have adhesions to, it, to the dura and so. Um, and the other thing is the spinal stenosis. Uh, most common in Europe is the spondylosis, thoracic spondylosis. More in Asian countries, you know that the OFL. We have that here also in uh, the Western countries sometimes. And the OPL, OPLL. thoracic OPLL. Poo. I, don't, I, I see one in two years or one in three years. I don't know. Yeah, although that's very rare for us. So surgical indication, of course, if it's possible, and conservative treatment. I told you already, radicular symptoms, normally you have these intercostal problems, but especially the T1 nerve uh, is responsible also for muscles of the hand and the T12 nerve uh, for the abdominal muscles. So mainly we have uh, central symptoms, and uh, especially when you look in the literature, also these atypical symptoms of the heart and the abdomen. Um, you know, from open surgery to reach the ventral aspect of the spinal canal can be difficult, especially at the thoracic spine or the junction between uh, the cervical spine and the thoracic spine. We have different approaches, depend all the time on the anatomy and pathology. And uh, to reach this uh, ventral area, ventral of the um, thoracic myelin, we have so-called, when we look at the literature, we have so-called non-anterior and anterior uh, approaches. And there's one goal all the time, and uh, to avoid the manipulation of the thoracic myelin. 
but until today we don't have clear standards which approach and which situ in which situation we have to choose. I think for that uh, it's not possible to, to create large studies because uh, this pathology is uh, too rare for that. Yeah? And the, another question is the additional uh, stabilization. Also here we don't have clear uh, standards, but we can say when we resect a lot of stabiliza uh, stabilizing structures of the posterior aspect, or if we uh, resect more than half of the vertebral body from the anterior aspect, we can uh, discuss uh, an, an additional stabilization. So coming to the full endoscopic appro uh, approaches, we have uh, three approaches, interlaminar, extra, not trans, as so all the time an extra foramen approach, and uh, the trans thoracic approach. Um, how to choose the approach? Yeah, first we define uh, our working area, yeah, where we have to uh, go, uh, where we have to decompress, and then we have to define our approach, which, which approach is possible, or with which approach is it possible to decompress, <laughs> And on the other hand, that's the most important thing, again, to avoid manipulation of the myelin. And uh, with uh, these criteria, you choose your approach. The interline, or some, uh, some uh, general things, uh, the normal positioning only for the uh, transthoracic approach, we um, choose a an, an, an lateral positioning. And uh, <laughs> you know at the thoracic spine, uh, one uh, important thing is to to find the right level, yeah? So you have to count the levels. We do it with different needles and so, and uh, we count uh, all the time from S1, never from uh, the cervical spine. Yeah, and also here, we create the approach directly to the level, to the disc level, like we did it at the cervical spine. So starting with the interlaminar approach, we have a little bit of range from, from strictly posterior to a little bit posterior lateral. You see it also here. What we do is like at the lumbar spine in a stenosis, we preparate the interlaminar window, or very often we don't have an interlaminar window, so we have to preparate the, the lamina, cranial caudal, and the ascending and descending facet, and uh, the spinous process as well. Then we resect the bone there, and then the flavum ligament to get entry to the spinal canal. That's so. Uh, one example uh, at T12, at T12, we have the T1 nerve, and that's responsible for the muscles of the hand. I told that already. Uh, the advantage at T1 and T2 is that we have the sm nearly the smallest diameter of the thoracic myelin, so we have a lot of space laterally. So that's a combination between a yeah, foraminotomy and a, yeah, recess decompression. Yeah, we have to resect the bone, we have to find the flavum ligament at T12, and then we open the flavum ligament, we go lateral, although that's very close to that, what we know from the lumbar spine or from the cervical spine. But you see already the recess is very large here in, at the, up, in the upper thoracic spine. Yeah. And we resect here a little bit of bone from the ascending facet, then preparation of the recess. And uh, there's the sequestered material. Yeah, and if you have patients with problems of the muscles of the hand, never forget to look, to look in the MRI, especially at the T12 level. So here's the disc space that was a, a cranial sequestered herniation and there the thoracic myelin. Other cases, uh, just to see a little bit what is possible in cases like that, the beginning is very difficult to find the lamina, the cranial caudal lamina and the facet joint. Uh, sometimes you need a little bit of uh, time uh, to get the orientation and then you have to uh, resect bone if there is no interlaminar window. And, but, but that's all the time the same. You start cranial, descending facet, and then go to the uh, caudal lamina and the ascending facet. And you see how difficult it is to find the entry in the spinal canal sometimes in these patients. You also here you see calcification already. And then you have the thoracic myelin. Here we sequestered material. That's the thoracic nerve. The thoracic nerve again and also here the cranial and caudal situation. Yeah, and you see it's possible to work lateral of the thoracic myelin, 
like we know it from the cervical spine. Yeah? You cannot manipulate the myelin, but you can touch it and you can lift it a little bit with your instruments. Because due to the 25 degree optical system, you can look underneath the myelin. Yeah, thoracic nerve and the thoracic myelin. That's the foramen, the foramen area here. Good, but we have also the possibility to decompress also over the top to the contralateral side. That's also possible at the cervical spine. Yeah, and then for that you have to resect here also bone from the spinous process, then the contralateral flavum ligament and sometimes uh, the contralateral um, bone as well. Here um, an OFL. Yeah. So you start at your ipsilateral side. Also here the orientation at the beginning is uh, the most difficult part because due to the ossification of the flavum ligament, yeah, you cannot identify a cranial lamina, a caudal lamina, or a flavum ligament. Yeah? So you have to identify as good as possible, and then you start uh, with a bone resection in this OFL. Yeah? And you see here that's a cranial lamina. Okay, here should be the flavum ligament, but normally it's bone. Yeah? And uh, then you have to create uh, through this bone with your drill um, an approach to the spinal canal. Once you have that, then the situation is easier because you have uh, the orientation. Yeah, so like here, yeah, and then you can you can start to resect the rest of the bone with a, with a punch or with a, with a diamond burr depends all the time. So and after the ipsilateral decompression, you go to the over the top to the contralateral side and resect the flavum ligament or the bone or whatever you have there. Other, that here is the joint from was the joint from the opposite side, and then you have the completely decompressed thoracic myelin, for example. Now with a with a unilateral approach and uh, bilateral decompression. So the extraframal approach or the transframal approach is not possible at the thoracic spine. Our hypomochelion <laughs> or a kind of hypomochelion here is of course uh, the, um, the the myelin itself. Yeah, and uh, we have also here a little bit range from posterior to more posterior lateral. Um, facet joint and the ribs. Yeah, these are two bony or two hard structures. And uh, that means normally we have to resect here a little bit bone from the facet joints to get the entry to the spinal canal. Yeah, we normally we start, like we saw it uh, from Mr. Verapan, we start here at the, uh, at the facet joints and uh, normally we start with re bone resection at the descending facet. Then we look at the ascending facet and we can preparate then the complete foramen until we have the orientation. Yeah, and uh, if you have a soft disc herniation, okay, we can pull out. But if we have hard or calcified compression from anterior, then we have to resect here parts of the vertebral body as well. And we can do it in this called box shape osteotomy. Yeah, like uh, that's something we know also from transthoracic uh, operations at the thoracic spine. So we have some examples here. So that's the thoracic nerve here, the ascending facet. Here's a foramen. You see it's never possible to go through the foramen or the transforamal approach. Also, you have to resect bone, start here. That's the descending facet. Then we start at the ascending facet. And uh, until you get here, the entry to the spinal canal. Uh, there we see already a little bit the thoracic myelin. And unfortunately, in, mo in most cases, uh, you find calcified or partially cal calcified material, and it's yeah, more difficult to resect that. Yeah. Also here, we resect a little bit bone from the vertebral bodies to come underneath 
this thoracic myelin. That's the myelin here, and that's the area we have decompressed. Here the entry in the intervertebral space, and that's the situation after decompression. Yeah, and also here you see that's a myelin. Around the myelin are one or two millimeter liquid. That's the reason you can mobilize a little bit the dura of the, of the thoracic myelin, but not more. Yeah? Another situation here, again, that's a foramen. Yeah. First, you have to resect bone, normally from the descending facet, that's the descending facet. Then you go to the ascending facet and enlarge the foramen. Yeah. Until you get the entry to the spinal canal. see here the dura of the thoracic myelin and here the pathology. Yeah, and again, it's unfortunately, it's not, uh, these are normally not free fragments. It's very rare that you have really free fragments. Yeah, so, yeah. Or a combination, free fragment with partial calcified or hard uh, calcified uh, parts or hard uh, annulus and you have to resect that directly and that's not so easy. Yeah? That's a posterior longitudinal ligament. Yeah, that's the situation after the decompression and also here you need this floating of the um, neural structures. Another situation also here, that's a foramen, or oh, it's not there, the foramen. Uh, here the bone, that's a thoracic spinal nerve. And you have to enlarge the foramen. Uh, again, until you have entry to the spinal canal. But in cases like that, normally you have all the time in front of you the bulged annual so it's very difficult, or it's difficult sometimes to decide, okay, I'm in the spinal canal. You can use the x-ray, of course, yeah. So here we have to resect also bone in a box shape, uh, like box shape uh, osteotomy. Yeah, that's the intervertebral space on right and left side. You resect the bone just in front of you until you reach the opposite side. Yeah? And you perform a kind of indirect decompression. But you have to, in cases like that, you have to reach the opposite side. Now that's a box shape osteotomy here uh, for Raymon. And there you see the thoracic myelin. And you have decompressed indirectly with this box shape osteotomy until you reach the opposite side. And again, you need this floating of the new structures. Another situation here, the thoracic nerve. Now that's the, descending facet. the descending facet is resected a little bit already. And then. Yeah, try to find entry to the spinal canal. Yeah, resect the lateral aspect of the ascending facet. And then you see here already the thoracic myelin or the dura, and there the pathology. Yeah? Yeah, and really look that you resected everything until you reach the opposite side or depends on the pathology. Yeah? But really be sure that you have resected everything. Yeah? And again, the situation here, the disk space, situation after decompression. Yeah? That is allowed with a thoracic myelin. Yeah? You just mobilize yeah, the, 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 the liquor, yeah? the, only the dura, and you don't mobilize the cervical myelin, uh, the thoracic myelin. So what is with the transthoracic approach? Uh, it's, also, it's a lateral approach. We try to do it mainly retropleural. 
Uh, you know, uh, these are or you know, it's, it's problems at the thoracic spine, and the um, yeah, transthoracic approach is difficult cranial of the vertebral body five uh, <laughs> uh, due to the atsigos vein, especially on the right side. On the left side, you have uh, the arc of the um, our uh, aorta, and so yeah. So the um, preparation is like in in, in open uh, surgery, transthoracic surgery. Uh, with double uh, lumen intubation. So you choose your approach, and uh, your endpoint is also very close to what we know from the open surgery. Your endpoint is the head of the rib. Yeah? And uh, if in case, uh, we try to do that retroplural. Uh, in case of damaging the pleura, the pleura, try to go on retroplural. Yeah? Because the problem is when you go uh, transplural, um, yeah. All the you, you, there's no possibility that the water uh, stays or your, your irrigation stays in your working area, and that's a problem because that's then not a, a working under constant irrigation. Yeah. Why preferential retroplural? We know that also from open surgery, uh, it's the shortest route. It's a very atraumatic approach, but uh, mainly here for the endoscopic procedures, the irrigation remains in the operating area. Yeah, that's very important. Preparation. That's also close to know what uh, to that what we know from open surgery. We have to resect the other. We, we uh, preparate the head of the rib. Then we have to resect the head of the rib. Then we have to resect the posterior wall of the vertebral bodies and the um, pedicle, and do also here the box shape osteotomy. Depends. Sometimes you have uh, softer fragments. Sometimes you have hard fragments. But normally you perform the transthoracic technique in more giant, in more calcified herniations. So a box shape osteotomy, osteotomy is necessary. That's only an example. It's every time different. Uh, so here, that's a retroplural approach. Approach. Yeah. You, you see the, the the blunt dissection of the retroplural approach. Approach. Yeah, then we have here, next is preparation of the head of the rib. That's the rib here. The segmental vessels, normal, it's not necessary in all cases to coagulate them. But you can do a special tool for the endoscope. So then we have here yeah, the intervertebral space, and then here the head of the rib. And you have to resect the head of the rib. There's no other possi possibility. After resection of the head of the rib, you preparate the pedicle. Yeah? And then you have to resect the pedicle. Yeah? And after that, you see the resected pedicle here. Yeah? From here to here. That's a pedicle. Here's the head, what I was, the head of the rib. It's not necessary in all cases to resect the complete pedicle, but you have to get entry to the spinal canal. Yeah? And after the last bony layer, there is the spinal canal and the thoracic myelin. And with this transthoracic approach, it's a lateral approach, yeah? you are, have more possibilities to work underneath the thoracic myelin without manipulating or damaging the myelin. Yeah, and then it depends on the anatomy and pathology, what you have to resect there. And the final situation is again that, that you have the thoracic myelin, you have the floating of the thoracic myelin, and you have to be sure that you com decompress completely to the opposite side. Yeah, and here you see this, again this box shape osteotomy. Yeah. So what can we say? Stay read to plural as long as possible. Also when you open the pleura at the beginning, and warm up the irrigation. Yeah, you're very close to the um, uh, to the thorax, to, uh, to the thoracic uh, area, uh, to to the heart. Yeah, and uh, you have to be careful due to the body temperature. And finishing, it's we don't use, if we do that, we don't use a drain. Um, we do, we just do that maneuver to get out the uh, air. That's very very um, rare. We do it only in a damaged pleura. Leakage of the dura, you can have that, especially when you use a transthoracic approach. Normally, then you have these giant herniations, 
and uh, there's a yeah, high percentage of uh, dura leakage, and it's the same like in open surgery, a direct suturing or something is not possible. So just uh, yeah, cover it with a, with an artificial dura or something. So what can we say? Posterior pos uh, pathology, we use an interlaminar approach. Posterior, uh, posterior pathology is here in, in, in Germany or in the Western countries, sometimes OFL, but the posterior pathologies are rare. Yeah? Sometimes we have some herniations, very, very lateral soft herniations. We can also choose the interlaminar approach. Um, intraforaminal pathologies yeah, with radiculopathy. We use the extraforaminal approach, but we use this extraforaminal approach also for a lot of anterior pathologies. But maybe the more medial and the more giant is more we have to use the anterior, uh, the transthoracic approach. But we can say the most frequent approach for us at the thoracic spine is the transforamal, extraforaminal approach. And we learned very fast that we have really a, a, a large or broad spectrum with the transforamal approach, more than we expected at the beginning. We are m much more able to reach the, the area anterior of the thoracic myelin to the opposite side without manipulating the myelin with the extraforaminal approach. So do we need, when we, when we work at the thoracic spine, do we need uh, so three approaches? It's not possible everything with one approach. No, we know that from open surgery, we need this range of approaches because our first goal is to avoid the manipulation of the thoracic myelin. Yeah? Because we know operations at the thoracic spine or the thoracic myelin are really high risk operations with the highest rate of complications. So conclusion. Ah, here, high-risk uh, surgical lesions, yeah. We know that from the literature. Um, the surgical treatment is uh, relatively rare. That means low incidence, means also low experience, low technical experience for us as uh, surgeons. Uh, we should be able to perform uh, different techniques, maybe central calcified, more anterior or more transthoracic approach. And uh, the topic of about the additional fusion is not completely clarified. Um, you have to plan every thoracic procedure new in an individual way. Yeah, look for your approach, how to, se how to select the approach, and never forget, do some, don't do anything with manipulation of the myelin. Yeah, we have also in the, lit in the literature uh, more and more um, yeah, reviews or, some, or, or data to see that we can avoid some things when we also work at the thoracic spine with MIS techniques. Um, we can say with these full endoscopic techniques, the sufficient decompression is uh, possible, but we use it only in single level um, pathologies. We have some technical advantages, of course, with the irrigation and the visualization, the 25 degree system, the, so we can uh, work and look underneath the thoracic myelin. We have the same uh, advantage as the cervical spine. We have definitely reduced traumatization. Yeah, okay, it's combined with fusion. But I told you already, the um, experiences clinically and technically, technically are definitely limited because it's a rare situation. Yeah? And if you are not sure, or if you have, uh, if we have uh, um, situations like that, we we'll perform it in a conventional way. Yeah? yeah. So never forget. Yeah, at the thoracic, especially at the thoracic spine, if you want to work that, you need this range of other techniques. Thank you very much, Dr. Rütten, for this very nice presentation. We are now back here and we are live connected to Dr. Rütten and Dr. Komm and they are ready now for your questions. We received a lot of questions from all over the world in the meantime and we would like to start with the first question from Dr. Vargas, Dr. Rod Vargas from Brazil. And uh, his question is about Angio CTs uh, for the uh, thoracic applications. Do you prefer this Angio CT? because of uh, localization of this Adam Kievich artery um, in thoracic um, applications? Dr. Rudden? Uh, the question is from me, yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, topic. Um, 
But I think today we can say uh, in, in single level or decompression surgery at the thoracic spine, um, there is no, no high risk of uh, producing paraplegia due to uh, damaging of the Adamkiewicz artery. Uh, I think we, we have this problem mainly in multi-level uh, vertebral columnar section, for example, in, in, in tumors or something. So that means, although we for ourselves, we don't perform um, angiocity or something like that to find the Adamkiewicz artery, and I think so uh, most of the surgeons don't do that worldwide. Uh, but if you if you worry, you, you, you can uh, use that diagnostic criterion as all the time, of course, yeah? but we don't do that. Okay, thank you very much. We have the next question from Nigeria. Uh, for Dr. Komp, uh, for this, um, uh, he is asking about plasma ablation, means coblation and lasers compared to endoscopic techniques and probably the RF techniques when we talk about um, soft disc herniations and non-sequestrated uh, disc herniations at the cervical spine. Do you have experience with lasers, using lasers for the cervical spine as well? Well, we don't have much experience, but I think, uh, um, of course, we have a lot of experience with using radio frequency uh, laser at the lumbar spine. Um, but um, I think when we are talking about endoscopic procedures, we are talking about focusing on intraspinal located problem. And we want to visualize that. And of course, we use infrared the radio frequency um, but uh, I think that you cannot draw a line or do the comparison between an intradiscal therapy, either with uh, laser or other methods, to an endoscopic procedure. So I uh, cannot answer this question, uh, maybe uh, how the person likes to uh, have the question answered. Yeah, but in general, you can do the same things with a radio frequency probe under continuous visualization when you do of course, yes, uh, yeah, of yeah. course the, 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 the possibilities are there, but uh, of course you use the, mm. the endoscope to have uh, the visualization. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. We have a next question also from Nigeria to Dr. Rutten. If you have or if you accidentally hit the, the cervical, um, the cervical, um, the, the cervical spinal cord, um, is there any case that you put the patients to the ICU unit after that, or you have to do that, or are you doing that in, in, in all cases for these uh, cervical applications? Okay, you know, when we talk about these decompressions at the cervical spine, we talk mainly about the posterior approach, that mm -hmm. means a foramenotomy technique. And in these cases, it's important to reach the epidural space, especially the ventral epidural space, lateral of the cervical myelin. Mm -hmm. Then that is a very important goal. And uh, that has to be your goal uh, per during performing the uh, approach. And uh, also, until today, we, we never had a problem with the central nerve system in cervical spine surgery with the posterior approach. And uh, we never, we never took patients to the ICU unit, uh, ICU. Also, th th there's no reason to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. According to your experience, and um, we get another question for the endoscopic cervical spine surgery from UK um, about instabilities caused by resection of the facet joints. Uh, probably, Doctor. Uh, Com, can you can you uh, answer these questions, please? Yeah. First of all, um, when you decompress uh, bony structures, uh, of course you take the way that are responsible for uh, stability. But you also know that we do this in an open way, like here for amyotomy, uh, where we not regularly fuse additionally. And um, when you do measurements afterwards with the CT, you see that the, um, the violation of the bony structures is even less in endoscopic surgery. So uh, to our experience, uh, we don't have any problems with instability after a uh, posterior approach. Yeah, and another question connected with this topic, Dr. Comp, 
are there some landmarks uh, how far you have to resect the the facet um, and uh, yeah and probably parts of the laminae um, are there some rules or landmarks that you yeah recommend? So the rules are uh, yeah prescripted by the anatomy and uh, if you have a herniation which is sequestrated to the craniocortical aspect you have to resect parts of the lamina to uh, get access to this area lateral of the dura of the cervical myelom if you have a herniation which is lying really uh, far lateral in the uh, foramen you have to resect more uh, to get access to the foramen but of course using the endoscope like a joystick you have the possibility to um, um, to change your trajectory so you don't have to resect that much uh, of bone. But even there, and uh, there is one important thing, uh, you have the possibility, for example, to reach easily uh, the vertebral artery. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, so you can get really lateral of the structure, so be careful. Sometimes you lose your orientation and then the vertebral artery may be directly in front of you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, Another questions, uh, question to Dr. Rütten. Do you have experiences with intradural prolapses at the cervical or even thoracic spine? Have you seen some cases like that? Yeah. No, also at the cervical spine, not also not at the uh, thoracic spine. The only thing we know is that uh, at the thoracic spine, a lot of discs are calcified and uh, there are uh, very often um, strong adhesions between the dura and the disc itself, but uh, real intradural herniations um, at the thoracic or cervical spine, I don't have experience with. Okay, thank you very much. Another question is about the thoracic applications, Dr. Rütten, um, especially um, for the uh, transthoracic approach. How do you prepare? the retro-plural space in, in this um, surgery? Do you have some special, do you use some special tools for, for doing that? Um, the, uh, the, the transmission was not too good. I think it's the question how we manage the transcriber approach. Yes. Well, the, well, the first thing is to, to get access uh, to, to the to the rib and to the uh, retroplural mm -hmm. area, you just use your finger to start with that, and then uh, step by step you follow the uh, the rib, um, and um, you do this blunt dissection like you know that from open surgery with your finger with uh, so, uh, with uh, soft instruments until you find the head of the rib. Um, so it is just uh, uh, following the anatomy, and then when you have the head of the rib, uh, you start with bone resection until you find the pedicle, and then you get access to the spinal canal. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope this was sufficient answer for, for our guest. Um, another question, Dr. Rütten, what is the incidence of dural injuries in, in cervical, for the cervical applications here? Are there, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so in cervical spine, in, in the cervical endoscopic surgery is uh, um, Less than one percent. Yeah. So normally, it's, so the dural injury in cervical spine surgery from posterior, it's not a problem. Yeah. yeah. So the norm, we don't see that normally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then another question after uh, the cervical procedures um, are: Do the patients need cervical collars, uh, special braces, or something like that uh, for this post-operative um, treatment? Doctor Com, probably. Yeah. Well, I, it's it's a little bit a question of philosophy. We give uh, our patients a soft uh, soft collar for uh, just a, a week until uh, the um, stitch comes out. But this is more a, a psychological thing because the uh, doctors outside uh, at the beginning when we started with that said, "Well, please, uh, the patients are so mobile. Um, just uh, remember them that they are operated." So I think uh, you also can do this without uh, any uh, color or bracing or whatever. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Dr. Rütten, probably another uh, question about the uh, anterior approach, yeah? the, about the resection of the PLL in anterior approaches. How often you have to resect the PLL in order to, get the, to reach this, uh, this prolapse? Any experience for that or recommendations? 
You mean at the cervical spine? Yeah, or? cervical spine and anterior approach. Uh, I think that's the same like in conventional surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, also on your philosophy, although we for ourselves, we open the PLL um, in every case mm -hmm. to have a direct visualization to the dura and, can, and, and that we can control definitely the decompression. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Dr. Kom, another question, uh, because we saw in your surgery using this uh, RF bipolar probe um, and you, you work very close to the neural structures there in order to stop bleeding. Is there a recommendation for the power setting of this RF machine or RF probe that you are using? Yeah, normally we reduce the uh the power a little bit compared to the lumbar spine. Um, I think I don't think that we can give any regular uh, tips. The most important thing is when you use the radio frequencies, um, don't use first the uh, just use the coagulation function mm -hmm. at the cervical spine, um, and uh, be aware of course that you are working near neural structures, but the that working near neural structures is not that different to the lumbar spine, for example, yeah, because when you're working on blood, the bleeding vessels on uh, d directly at the dura, you are uh, careful anyway mm -hmm. where you are. Yeah, and additionally, of course, that's the reason why we use a four megahertz uh, generator, uh, because then, of course, the the risk that you transport more more heat to the surrounding tissue is less than with the normal HF generator that are usually working with 350 kilohertz. Um, another question, Dr. Rutten, about how do you manage failed back syndrome? Is that the topic for, for the cervical spine? Or? Yeah, that's a, that's a very complex question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First, we have to define what is failed back surgery, yeah. since, mm -hmm. especially today. Yeah, and uh, the second is if we have that, I think there are so many, um, so many things we have to consider. I don't know instability, degeneration, maybe scar tissue, and so on. And I think further treatment depends on all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think I cannot give an, a sufficient answer mm -hmm. for that question. Okay, thank you. And another question about these thoracic uh, applications. Um, the risk of paraplegia for uh, during that surgery or, yeah, any, any, um, well, yeah. Of course, uh, there are different um, possibilities, you know, uh, that um, operating at the central nerve system is always uh, or may always be a problem, especially uh, when we're talking about uh, giant uh, disc herniations. Um, we personally were lucky not to have a problem like that. Uh, but of course, um, I think the big advantage for using the endoscope is that you have really a perfect visualization of the situation. But uh, the anatomical and pathological problem working near the neural structures, um, maybe you have adhesions and you have to work with mechanical power mm -hmm. um, and you have a very vulnerable structure in front of you, um, you definitely have to tell the patient that you have this uh, have a high risk when you're working in this area, especially at the thoracic spine, less at the cervical spine. But um, you have this risk, but uh, we were lucky until now to, uh, mm. that nothing happens in our patients. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kom. Dr. Rutten, one more question about the instrumentation for these cervical uh, endoscopic procedures. Are you using the same sizes of rongeurs and uh, forceps as you use for the lumbar uh, applications, or do you use smaller diameters for the cervical? Yeah, so uh, we prefer to use a smaller endoscope at the cervical spine and also uh, smaller instruments, yes. Yeah, that means usually 2 millimeter, 2.5 millimeter, yeah, yeah or 3 millimeter. 
you know, up to three. But sometimes you need really the, the, the very small instruments uh, to work inside the spinal canal uh, without uh, damaging uh, something there at the dura also. Yeah. yeah. Also, we saw the using of drills there. What is yeah. the diameter of this drill? It's three millimeter, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Also, use the, the biggest one I can use with a smaller endoscope. Yeah. yeah. And okay. um, that's also what we find out. It's if you want to drill very precisely, then then you need um, a drill that is is guided strongly in the endoscope. Therefore, it it it, it is really recommended to use a three millimeter drill in inside the three point one millimeter working channel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, avoid the, the slipping of the tip. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we use always the drill that fits in the intraendoscopic working channel. Yeah, okay. Then, uh, any tips for, yeah, we, we have another question. I, I think it's about the thoracic uh, applications. Any landmark while doing revision surgeries? I mean, probably it's a question about this uh, interlamina approach for the thoracic spine and uh, as we know there are some might be some adhesions or something like that and uh, is it easy to identify the structures with endoscopic techniques or do you have any landmarks when you start this surgery for for this i think it's also a question for the lumbar applications i guess right in general so uh, i i think first of all we don't have much it's uh, with yeah. revision uh, surgery at the thoracic spine uh, mm -hmm. when you see uh, that we really, uh, even though we are doing about 1,500 uh, endoscopic cases, uh, we have about, uh, you heard it in the presentation, uh, so these cases are quite rare. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, the only thing I can remember was a hematoma that was just uh, two days after surgery, so uh, this is quite easy when you're talking about open pre-operated patients. Um, I personally don't have any experience about that, but uh, it would be, we would do the same like we do in the lumbar spine. That means, first of all, you put, when you do an interlamin approach, uh, for example, you put your endoscope uh, and your working um, cannula to the bony part where you're sure that you're not perforating any uh, thing uh, to, uh, in direction to the spinal canal. And then you uh, preparate until you find the medium margin of the um, bony structure and then you have to release adhesions if they are adhesions and uh, then um, you start to get uh, access into the uh, spinal canal. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question may I, about the, the pressure already. Um, we, we, uh, we always discuss this question, especially when you work on the cervical or thoracic spine, the irrigation fluid and the pressure that uh, is, is going there during the, um, or inside the endoscope and inside the, the intra-spinal um, space. Um, some recommendation about the pressure settings on the pump. Um, I think um, probably I can answer that because this is uh, there are two um, possibilities how to manage this pressure inside the spinal canal. First of all, it's very important to use an endoscopic system which is designed that you don't have too much inflow compared to your outflow. That means you should always have an open outflow for the endoscope and the diameter of the space for for the outflow should much bigger than for the inflow. Then in general, you cannot increase this intraspinal pressure. Uh, even when you set up the pump to 80 or 100, because when, once you have more outflow than inflow and the, the system is not closed, then you only can get, reach the, the pressure of the water column when the water is coming out of the working channel or out of the uh, outflow channel. And that's important. And on the other hand, if you really want to make 100% sure that you will never um, close the outflow, even during the surgery, then um, 
you should use a pump that regulates the, the pressure very safely inside. For that we have a we use a very special pump with a spine mode and this pump makes sure that the intraspinal pressure will never be higher than 40 mmHg. So that these are the two recommendations for that. Another question is about the size of the working channel of the anterior cervical system. Dr. Komp, are you or? Well, in, in fact, uh, you, um, you, you know uh, the, the millimeters much better than, than me. In yeah. fact, it's a special system due to the uh, situation that we uh, insert uh, the, um, uh, the endoscope in a small working tube and uh, um, there we have the possibility to work in. So we uh, work beside the endoscope. We don't have an intra-endoscopic yeah. working channel for that. This is due to the situation that we really have very small, uh, or very uh, just some uh, millimeters where we can work um, in with a uh, whole system. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this uh, cervical system has a special design with an oval sleeve, and we have space for using up to 2.5. Depends how which sleeve you are using to three millimeter uh, working instruments. Um, that means you can use the RF probe uh, that, are, that are you using for the lumbar indications as well. Uh, also for the cervical spine anterior approach with that system. And one more advantage of the system is that you really have a very clear view of visualization because we have a Rotland system. So, Thank you very much, Dr. Rutten, Dr. Kamp. This was the last questions. Thank you for your time, for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you for the great lectures and, and OR performance, Dr. Kamp and Dr. Rutten. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you soon uh, for the next webinars. Greetings to Herne and uh, greetings to our international guests today. We had a lot of guests during the whole session. Thank you for your interest. If you want to hear more about and see more about that uh, techniques, but also uh, about our training possibilities, please contact us on our website or write an email to education at Thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Stay safe.